Hey everybody, how's it going? Corey here from ThemeCo with a video on the effects module. Now for me personally, while there's a lot of fun stuff coming out in this release cycle, I think this might be the feature that I am most excited about. I am really pumped to just be able to give you all the ability to natively leverage the power of things like opacity, CSS filters, transforms, and so much more in this release and all from directly within the tool. Now there's a lot going on in the effects module. We can do some really powerful things like interaction effects, scroll effects, and there's also some really cool kind of bonus features such as being able to chain child effects when you interact with a parent, as well as these kind of bonus specialty features of mixed blend mode and backdrop filter, which once you see how those work, I think you're kind of gonna wonder how you lived without them for so long. There's a lot to cover here, but I think you're gonna see that the effects module is very simple, very approachable. So let's just dive right in. Now I do wanna start by saying that this video is meant to be a cursory overview of the module as a whole. So I'm not gonna get super in the weeds on how to create certain effects or why I'm doing what I'm doing. There'll be more videos on that later, but for today we're really just kind of showcasing some of the stuff going on in here. All right, and a final bit of context for this video is I've got two examples set up here, a button in this section and then an image kind of overlaid over a split color background. And these are just gonna help me illustrate a couple different facets of the effects module. And then one last thing that I wanna bring your attention to is a preference that I think you will find particularly helpful when working with effects. And that is this preserve inspector group toggle. By default, when we navigate between elements in the live preview area, clicking on a new element will always auto inspect the first control group of that element because this is the expected behavior as we simply move through our document. However, when you're working on something like effects, it's typical to maybe have three, four, five, or more elements in a row that perhaps you're timing some things out or getting all of their interaction space just the way you want. And doing this, it could be cumbersome having to click to a new element and always have to go back down to that effects module just to make some tweaks over here. So turning this toggle on will allow you to click from an element like this button over to the column and preserve that effects group as you move through those elements. So just a quick uh, workflow enhancement tip that we highly recommend you look into if you're working on some more detailed effects on a longer page. Now with that all out of the way, let's get started. So we've got our button here, and for the vast majority of elements when you open up the effects module, this is what you'll see at first. We've got our base control group. The base control group will allow us to set static values for all of these properties, such as our opacity. So if we wanted our button completely invisible or perhaps partially faded out, we can do that here. But the real fun starts with things like filters and transform. If you're not familiar with filters, they're effectively a way for us to apply graphical changes to our elements while we're working with them in the browser. It's almost like applying a, a brightness or contrast filter in Photoshop, but the cool thing is we can do it not only on images in the browser, but also elements. So I'm gonna click on this filter swatch here and you're gonna see this modal pop up. Now, if you're a more under the hood type of person, you can of course type in your values here but if you're not familiar with filters, you don't have to worry at all. You can simply click this plus up here and it's gonna add a filter for you in this list. Now by default, it will start with this blur filter, which as we can see, based on its name is blurring our button, which is very fun to kind of play around with. But we also have this list of different types that you can work through. And I'm just gonna click through them really quickly right now to kind of give you a sense of what we can do with these filters. So. You've seen blur here. I'm gonna to go to brightness and just run down the scale a little bit on each of these. Contrast, grayscale. Now, the cool thing with grayscale and sepia is that you don't have to go 100% grayscale or sepia with either of those. You can mix in just a little bit of those values if you want to, and it can be particularly cool on images, which I'll show you here in just a second. Next, we've got Hue Rotate, another really fun one to play around with, again, particularly on images. We've got Invert, Saturate, 
and then sepia, which gives us that kind of faded, old-timey photograph feel. Now I'm going to close these out for right now and just jump down to our image here. Open up our filter pop-up. We see blur, brightness, contrast, grayscale. Again, we can just mix in a little bit if we want and get a tiny amount of that effect, which is very fun to play around with. Hue rotate. Invert. Saturate. And sepia. Now, the really cool thing about filters and transforms, actually, is that they are linear in nature, meaning we can chain multiple filters together and the order that we place them in will actually give us a different output. So if I wanted to add a second filter to this photograph, I could click the plus again, and you'll see we've got our sepia filter from before, and that is first in our list here. But then if I go up here to hue rotate, you'll see that we get this output. Now this is kind of a fun thing I like to play around with sometimes where I might do a sepia filter first, which puts everything in like a yellow scale versus grayscale, which is just black and white. And then I can play around with hue rotate to get a different color contrast with that photo. Now, remember how I mentioned that the order of these filters and transforms plays a role in how they're output. Watch what happens when I put hue rotate first in the list. Now you'll notice as I change the value for hue rotate, I'm getting different bits of output on this image, but ultimately, since my sepia filter is last, that is the final thing that's applying its blanket effect to everything. So do make sure that when you're working with filters, just kind of think through the order of how you've got them laid out and think, you know, is this the order I need things to be in to achieve the desired effect that I'm after? I'm gonna close these out for now and then go back up to our button. And next we have transforms. And if you're not familiar with transforms, they are effectively a way to move your elements around as well as rotate. Now we're gonna to get to rotation here in a second, but you'll notice with some of these that you might expect more of a 3D effect to take place. And unless we do a couple little things with this, it's gonna look more scrunched than 3D, but we'll touch on that in just a bit. We can of course scale things either on one axis or both axes. There is a Z value here, but for the most part, you will probably not mess with that a whole lot. We have our skewing values. And then finally we have perspective, which I will touch on in just a bit when I kind of show off um, a fun interaction effect that I worked on earlier. So for now, let's close these out. That just gives us a feel for what transforms are. And the thing to keep in mind with transforms is that this button is physically in this position on the page. This is its size and what it occupies. If I were to use something like margin to move that button over to the left, let's say, it would bump any other elements that were around it out of the way. But if I use something like translate or what we call move here, it is moving the button over, but only visually. Physically, that button is still right here in the document. So it's a subtle little thing to just be aware of. And as you play around with this more, you'll get a sense of how these things all tie together. But do keep that in mind when you're working with transforms. Now, another important thing to be aware of is our transform origin. By default, most transforms tend to start from the center. So for example, if I go to rotate Z here, and you'll see if I type in 45, it's just rotating around that center point on the button. However, let's say I change this to the bottom left corner of the button. Now, any transforms I make are happening from this corner of the button. Notice what happens when I update my rotate Z value. See how it's hinging off that bottom left value there? So again, keep these things in mind. Here's bottom right. You can get lots of different bits of output playing around with not only the values of your transforms, but also the origin of where it's starting from. That can be a really fun thing to play around with.
And finally, we have our transition control. Now, this is found on the effects module, but this actually does affect lots of different things within our elements, primarily colors. So for example, this button has a default duration of 300 milliseconds, and this is the easing function out of a big list of presets we've given you all to play around with that we use for all of our elements. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you don't adjust these values, these defaults on any element, you won't have any additional output put to the front end of your site. But adjusting any of these values will give you some dynamic CSS that goes to the front end. And again, that's obviously necessary as we tweak these values to taste. So as I said earlier, one thing to keep in mind is even though this transition module is found here with the effects grouping, it does affect other stuff like colors. Now, for example, my button does not have a hover color, but let's give it one really fast. So now when I hover, I've got that yellow background. And if I go to my effects module, and let's just say we make this one second, so 1000 milliseconds, you'll see as I hover over that button, going from red to yellow takes much longer than it did previously at 300 milliseconds. So while this is here on your effects module, keep in mind that it will affect other things like background colors, border colors, box shadow, text, um, as well as other things like particles. You know, the buttons have particles and also the layout elements have them in this release. And then it will affect your interaction effects as well. So with that being said, let's actually jump into that right now. now I'm gonna go back, link my colors up here, hop back over to effects. And now we're gonna start playing around with adding interaction effects on our button. So this is anytime we hover over that button, what should it do based off of these base values and what it should go to in this interaction value here. Now all of these are additive and we don't have to use all of them, but we can adjust them to taste. So for example, um, you might wanna have your button faded out for some reason at your base value, but then when you hover over, it goes to full visibility here. Additionally, I'm not entirely sure why you might wanna do this, but maybe you want to blur your button when it's just sitting there. And then we can go to no blur when we hover over that button. Finally, let's say that when we hover over our button, we want it to move up a little bit. So we'll have our base style be just basically a zero, zero coordinate. And then let's say for our transform here, I want it to move up 20 pixels. Now, again, this is a little bit of a silly example because it's kind of hard to read our faded blurry text here, but hopefully you're getting an idea of just the power of what you can start to explore with all of these elements here. And keep in mind, all those filters we ran through earlier, the grayscale, hue rotate, all of that stuff can be given a base value and then an interaction value and we can transition between them. Now, one thing that I find really fun here is doing certain effects in a combination sort of way. So I'm gonna zero out all of this content here, bring this back to one, delete my filter, delete my transform. And I'm gonna hop over to the button here and I've got a little box shadow that I set up earlier on here. I'll turn this on and you'll see that when I hover over it, I've got my box shadow coming down 16 pixels to the right and down. Now, another fun little aside here is if you set your base color on any shadow to transparent and then give your interaction an actual color, instead of just getting a fading effect between colors, you get this kind of motion happening with the shadow moving down. Now this is kind of a fun effect in and of itself, but let's say we wanted to give that button some movement up to match the movement of the shadow going down. So it actually looks like the shadow is appearing because the button has physically moved. So I'll take this value of 16 pixels, go over to my effects. I've got interactions turned on. I'm gonna add a transform. I'm going to move it up negative 16 pixels, which was the value from earlier. And you'll see that when I hover over this button now, we get a really cool combination of the movement of the button and the movement of the shadow 
appearing to kind of work in tandem with one another. So keep in mind that your effects can work with your standard controls on the elements as well. There's lots of fun ways we can pair all these things together and get some really cool results. I'm gonna quickly go back to my button here, turn off my box shadow, and then get rid of this transform. Now, if you're not the type of person that wants to you know, roll all of these effects on your own, we do have this animation type. Now, these are CSS animations. They're basically pre-built animations that you can't really tweak the motion of them, but you can specify the timing and the easing curve for them. And we do recommend that if you're using an animation, don't use any transforms for your base styling as well. You kind of need to fit into one camp or the other. Either use transforms all the way through, or you can use an animation on hover, and then we just wouldn't use a transform for the base style here. So when you click over to animation, you'll see that your transform input goes away. It's replaced by this animation selection. And then we also have this animation transition control. Now this is different from this transition control. This is for everything but animations. So think colors, particles, your effects, such as opacity, filter, transform, but animations are a little different. And that's because some of these effects, like you'll see when I hover over this button and I get this ta-da animation, which is coming from the bottom right. Let me center that again. That animation looks a lot better taking place over a longer time span than the traditional transition here. Notice if I put this to 300 milliseconds, it just looks a little jittery, right? So we have a separate animation transition control, and this is only for this animation you've selected here and if you've got this toggle set up here. So we can go through this list and just see a few different pre-built animations here. That was the wobble. Maybe I'll do a bounce. There's just a lot of fun things we can play around with here. Let's try Jello. And again, keep in mind, see how the motion of these look, they look a lot better taking place over a longer time span. So you do have this to adjust independently there if you so choose. All right, so we've touched on interaction effects. Now let's turn that off and talk about scroll effects. So scroll effects are a way as we move down the page, as that element comes into the viewport, we can trigger certain effects to take place and give some motion to our design. So you'll notice that I have this turned off. When I turn it on, I get this kind of fade in effect happening. And that is because by default, our type is set to transform. And then we have these two columns here. We have an in style and an out style. You can think of the out styles as sort of how should my element start? And then as I scroll to it and it comes into the viewport, how do I want it to end up? So for example, we have zero opacity and it's fading to one. And then we have a little bit of a translate here when it's out, that's where it's pushed down a little bit. And then as it comes in, it goes back to our zero, zero coordinate. So you can see that this stuff is additive and it's very easy to pick and choose what you want to do. For example, maybe for my out style, I want to add a little bit of a blur. And then when I come in, we can set it back to zero. Now, if you're testing out these transitions over and over again, one thing you might want to do is you can open up your preview manager here, go to your force scroll effects section, and we can quickly toggle something out and see it zeroed out and then turn this off to see it fade back in. And notice how my button moved up and faded in, but also that blur that we added from before is now taking place. So lots of fun stuff to play around with here. Next, we've got this offset section, and this is effectively when should this scroll effect take place in your preview. So for example, I'm gonna set this to zero and zero. And what this means is basically when the top of your element hits the very bottom of the browser as you're scrolling down, that's when the in effect should trigger. Now the top value here will only trigger if you're using this in out behavior where the animation is sort of coming in and out as you scroll past it. So 
To get a sense of how these all work together, I'm gonna to go to my column here, and I'm just gonna give it a slightly taller height here. So now my button is out of the viewport, right? Let me click back down here, go to effects, and I've got it set to once. I'm gonna scroll up here, turn this off, and then turn it on so we can re-trigger it. And notice how as I scroll down, you'll see it fade in as it hit the very bottom of the viewport because of that zero value. Now let me show you another variation of this. We could do something like 100 pixels. Again, I'll reset this. And notice how right as I got to about 100 pixels beyond the bottom of my viewport, that's when my button started its fade in effect. Now, since I have this set to once, it's only going to fade in and then stay just like that. And honestly, for the most part, we do recommend keeping the behavior on once because for the most part, people are going to scroll past a page and having things move in and out can be a little bit much to look at. But we do have these two other behaviors here for you all to play with if you would like. Now, what reset does is as you scroll down past the button, you'll see it come in and we go past it and it stays in. Now, as I'm leaving the screen again, you'll see when I get to about 100 pixels, it fades back to the out style. Because again, when it's 100 pixels from the bottom, it's fading back out. And then 100 pixels back in, it comes back. Now, the in and out behavior is kind of like reset, although as I come in, it fades in. And then as I leave, and you'll notice when I get to the very top of the browser here, it's going to fade out. So I come back in and then it goes out. So there's a subtle nuance between the behaviors here of once, reset, and the in-out behavior. So keep those in mind when you're trying to achieve a certain effect you're after. One other thing to keep in mind is that pixel values, of course, will be hard-coded. They'll always be 100 pixels, but using something, let's say like 10% and 10%, these will responsively update for different screen sizes. So these will adjust on a phone or a tablet, let's say, and work more in accordance with that device when you are working on those styles. Now, a lot like interactions, we also have pre-built animations for you to play around with if you don't wanna mess with any of this stuff here. So we can do our animations and you'll see that we get two select lists of options we can play around with. And you see right away, we've got our roll in and roll out style going. I'm gonna open up my preview manager here and I'm just gonna reset this to watch that one more time. So there's our roll in. And now if we wanna see it go out, there's our roll out and roll in. And there's a huge list here of things that you can play around with. So I'll just click zoom in left, see what that does. And maybe for out style, let's do light speed out right. So here comes our zoom and then our light speed out. Now notice too that these effects are additive. My blur is still being applied as it's coming in and out. So you can apply filters on top of these pre-built animations if you want to do that. Finally, you'll notice that for the scroll effects, we have our own transition control. And this one is a little different. This one works for both transform and animation because your scroll effects are very unique. You're going to want to time them exactly how you want. So no matter which type you're using, these will take place. And we also have a delay control. Now the delay control is nice if let's say you had three columns in a row and you wanted when you scrolled down to those columns for them to come in in a staggered fashion. You might set the same duration for all of those columns, but give them a slight delay, and that's how you'll get them kind of coming in one after another. One thing to keep in mind with the scroll effect module, when you have this turned on, your in style effectively overwrites these base controls, opacity, filter, and transform. So when this is turned on, these values become nullified. And we did that so that you could quickly experiment with turning this on, seeing if you like it, and then turning it off and going back to your base controls if you want. We didn't want you to have to constantly be changing these base values based on if you were or were not using a scroll style.
And the final thing to keep in mind with all of this is that these effects are additive. So I'm gonna go back to my transform type here and you'll see that I've got my fade in effect with a little bit of a blur and some motion. I'm gonna turn my interaction styles back on here. And again, like I mentioned earlier, if you're using transforms as a type, we need to make sure we're using transforms all throughout because sometimes mixing animations with transforms can get a little hairy. But let's say now that my button is faded in, I want when I hover over it to go back up 16 pixels like it did earlier. So I will force my button out to reset it. So there's our fade in effect and there's my hover effect. And again, I could hop back over here. I could find my box shadow, turn that on. And now we've got that going on. So now, We've got lots of different things happening. We've got our fade in effect when we scroll down to it. And then we've got a very engaging hover effect when we interact with the button. Now these interactions can get very detailed. And like I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a linear nature to the way that you structure the content within these. So I actually have a little pre-built example I've got here just to show you guys just how crazy you can get with some of this stuff. And I'm gonna show off our perspective control here as well. So let me grab my interaction effect. I'm gonna pop this in here. And then for this effect that I did, I liked it about over a second. And I'm also gonna use a different easing. I'm gonna use this in out back easing. And with this, you get kind of a cool rubber band effect. You'll see it here whenever I hover over the button. So without getting into all this just yet, just take a moment to uh, check out this style as we hover over the button here. Right, lots going on. We've got the box shadow on hover. We've got a lot of rotating and skewing and scaling going on. And then we've got the 3D preservation going on from using perspective. Now, one cool thing you'll see here, I pasted in those values and my list here is automatically reading out the values in here, and it will give you a little list here that you can play around with um, here if you prefer. But again, you can type these things in if you wish to do that instead. Now, this perspective value, if you're gonna use it, if you want to preserve a type of 3D effect, you need to place this first in line. And the value inside effectively allows you to set the amount of 3D perspective going on with that effect. So a larger number will reduce the intensity of that 3D effect, and a lower number will give you a lot more intensity. So one more time, watch when I hover over this button. And then you also need to make sure that these values match across both of your inputs. So I'm gonna adjust both of these to 500. And you'll see now when I hover, you see that rotation, it looks a lot more intense when I have a lower number there for my perspective. So there's a lot of detail you can play around with here from the perspective to the types of rotation you're using to the skewing, the scaling. Um, again, I'm not trying to go super in depth on these things in this particular video, just trying to showcase a little bit of what is possible. All right, so let's turn off our interaction effect here. And then I'm just gonna zero this out for now. I'm going to reset my transition value. And then let's jump down to our image from earlier. And I wanna show a couple of different pieces with this. So let's actually start with our mix blend mode control here. Mix blend mode is a little bit like filters, but it differs slightly in that Changing this value will affect how the content you're working with interacts with the content behind it. So that's why I've got this split section here for us to see how the white color on this side will change differently than the orange side here with our image. Now there are quite a few different mixed blend mode values we can play around with and they each do something very special and unique. So take a moment if you don't know them that intimately to just go look up online and see kind of what they do. But for me personally, sometimes too, it's fun to just experiment and see what you end up with by playing around with different values.
Now, one final thing to note here before we get started is sometimes you might see that if you select a value, for instance, I'm on my image here and I'm gonna select multiply, but you'll see that nothing has changed in the preview. And that's because with mixed blend mode, you need to apply it to the element that is directly above the background you're working on. So since my background here is on my grid element and this is a cell in the grid, instead of working with my image, I just need to go up one layer to my cell here, scroll down, and now I can apply a mixed blend mode effect to that cell and it will change how it interacts with those colors behind it. So real quick, I'm just gonna run through each of these values and you'll see kind of how it's changing the output that you're getting in the live preview. So we've got multiply, screen, overlay, darken, lighten, color dodge and color burn, hard light and soft light, difference, exclusion, hue, saturation, color, and luminosity. Now obviously some of these might appear to be a little more useful than others in this particular example, but this is also highly dependent on not only the source content you're working with, but also the background content you're working with. So like I said, definitely go do a little bit of research look into these blend modes and kind of understand what they're doing a little bit more, but they can also just be kind of a fun surprise to play around with and see what you come up with. But I hope you're starting to see kind of the power of basically having Photoshop at your disposal in the browser with these assets. If you wanted this image to be using sort of just a singular orange scale, instead of having to go into Photoshop and edit it, you could apply an orange background behind this entire image switch it over to luminosity, and then you've got that filtered image directly in the browser. Now, one thing to keep in mind with these mixed blend mode values is that they are a little intensive on the browser. Modern browsers tend to handle them just fine, but some browsers will have issues if you apply them in certain ways. So do be careful with how you use them and do test things across different browsers. Because um, for instance, I know that Firefox can sometimes have an issue if this would get applied to a video, which in general I would not recommend doing at all. Um, it can just kick in your computer fans like it's nobody's business. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, what's the content you're working with? How is the browser handling it? And, you know, maybe don't go super crazy on big elements all over the place, but it can be really fun to use as an accent here and there across your designs. All right, so I'm gonna set this back to normal and then I'm on my cell here and I'm gonna go into this cell and this is a new part of this release as well but the particles from our button element are now available on all layout elements so that means that I can enable these two particles that I've already designed here and when I hover over this cell you'll see those particles come in right so you know, you probably are familiar with the particles from the buttons. They're a really fun way to add some cool interaction to different elements. And now not only the button, but all your layout elements can use them as well. But I'm turning these on because I want to talk a little bit about chaining child effects. Now, all of your layout elements, and I'm going to click on this grid, which is the parent of all this content here, and I go to its effects module, you'll see this as the first control on all layout elements. It says link child interactions. So a big change with this update that we've introduced is that all of our layout elements are now linkable. So you could wrap any section, row, grid, cell, column in an anchor tag and link off somewhere. So when you do that, it might be common that you want, when you hover over that asset, for everything inside it to react to that hover state. And that's where these link child interaction controls can come in. So keep in mind, I have my particles in the cell here, and you'll notice when I hover over the grid outside here, those particles are not activated. But if I turn on link child interactions, you'll see we've got three values here, colors, particles, and effects. Now, I don't have anything else set up right now, just my particles. But notice when I hover over the grid, 
that my particles are triggered by hovering over this grid. Now I'm going to turn off effects and colors just for a moment to show something in a second here, but I hope you're starting to kind of um, get some ideas of just how powerful this is and the doors it opens up for you all to be creative in making your own fun effects. Now I have a little bit of an overlay thing that I played around with earlier, and it's just a button that's basically hanging out over my picture here. I'm going to turn off particles for a moment, and you'll see that when I hover over the cell, I get my particles because they're in the cell. And then when I hover over my button here, you'll see that it has a color change on the background. It's got a box shadow happening, which we kind of count with colors because box shadow is primarily a color change. And then it also has an effect. It's moving, it's translating up when I hover on it. So watch this. I could independently trigger those three different assets differently based on how I select these values. So let's just start with colors. So when I hover over the grid, you'll see that the color for that button changes and the box shadow comes in because that is technically a color. Now, if I wanted to, I could also add in effects, which would include the transform from that button. So see, I'm hovering over the grid, but I'm getting that button transform. Now I could add particles. So what this is gonna do is when I hover over the grid, it will trigger the particles on the cell and the colors and effects on the button. So lots going on here, but again, like I mentioned earlier, hopefully this is starting to kind of open up some ideas in your mind of how you might use this out in the real world. And the reason why we broke these three things out is because you might wanna have sort of an additive effect going on. Perhaps I only want my particles to be triggered by the grid, but then when I get to the button, I want those colors and effects to take place. So you could flip this and just do the button when you hover and then particles here, or like we just did a second ago, maybe we do particles when we hover over the grid and then when we get to the button, the colors and effects are triggered. There's just so much to explore here and we're really only scratching the surface with this very basic example. So um, definitely be on the lookout for some more videos in the future, but I wanted to just give you a quick overview of that link child interactions option. All right, so we're almost done here. There's one more thing I really wanted to touch on here and that is, let me go to my column and set this back to full height. Go to my section, add my background image. I wanna talk a little bit about backdrop filters. And if you haven't played around with those before, they can be a little tricky to understand, but they're pretty straightforward actually. So um, I've got this background here and it's a pattern that I'm just repeating over the background of the section. Now this is not super bad, but let's say that I went to my background color here and I dropped its transparency down to maybe 0.55. You'll see that when I do that, it's not super bad, but some of these elements that are behind here are kind of maybe a little noisy, kind of interfering with my text a little bit, distracting from the content inside my button, a prompt I'm trying to get my users to take. So this is where backdrop filters can be really fun. Now I drop this down to be transparent because to use a backdrop filter, you're affecting the things behind the element you're applying it to. So your background needs to be either transparent or partially transparent for these backdrop filters to work. So now that I have a partially transparent background for my button, I'm going to go to my backdrop filter here. And this is just like the filter module up here. It's all the same values, but you're applying it to the content behind the button. Now, the most uh, fun thing I think about this is applying a blur effect. So watch as I add this value in. Notice how the content behind has now been blurred slightly, and it reduces kind of the noise of those little patterns kind of bumping into my text a little bit. We can, of course, increase this value almost to the point where you don't even see what's going on behind that button anymore. So the real fun in it is kind of using it almost as like a frosted glass kind of effect. And I wanted to use this as an example because it's just a really simple way to illustrate how we can use these filters to really create some depth and nuance to our designs that 
just really make them very engaging. And of course, like the other filters, these are linear and we could add multiple values if we want. So for example, maybe I wanna do a hue rotate and you'll see that as I go through here, it's very subtle, but there's a change to the background happening with that hue rotate. Or perhaps I wanna use a sepia tone or grayscale, or we could adjust the contrast of the content back there. Lots of fun things that you can do with backdrop filters. Just the main thing to keep in mind is that your background does need to be either fully or partially transparent to see it taking effect. Another thing to keep in mind is that browser support might be a little sketchy from time to time, although it is increasing all the time. So I would recommend doing something like this, where your button does have some type of color so that for a browser that doesn't support those, they at least have the color to offset it. Now, there is some fun stuff you can do, for example, if you aren't worried about certain older browsers. Like for instance, making your background completely transparent, you could just blur the content behind there and get some really cool effects even with that. There's just so much to explore, but we do kind of recommend that with these specialty effects in particular, that you be very aware of your particular customer base, the browsers are using, and if these effects are supported well and those are not. All right, wow. So I know that was a lot to cover, but hopefully you guys, like I've mentioned a few times already, are starting to kind of have the wheels turn a little bit, get some ideas going on how you might want to use this in your own designs moving forward.